D don't steal my time. I uh, already took my coat off. You know why? Because I want to fight for your souls. We prayed last fall for at least one convert, for a wretched sinner to turn to Jesus. Now, many wretched saints responded and said, wonderful, this is a message that touches our heart. But I want you to pray for at least one sinner to be repenting today that the Spirit of God uses the chaplain and me as the pipeline through which the grace of God gets into your soul. Now, I would like to start with reading the theme verses in Ezekiel 36. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, it is not for your sake that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went in exile. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned, declares the Lord, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight, for I'll take you from the nations gather you from all the lands, bring you into your own land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you'll be finally careful to observe my ordinances. Let me pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we covered one aspect of this threefold promise. And as we now turn to the second aspect, we plead with you that you will use us as pipelines through which the grace of God will flow into the hearts of the people and they may respond in a powerful way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the fall, I spoke on the heart transplant. That's what regeneration is all about. And I have five questions. Why do you need a heart transplant? What does it take to get a heart transplant? When do you know that you have a heart transplant? And how does it show that you have a heart transplant? And I would like to do exactly the same four questions about what the chaplain mentioned, the doctrine of justification. That is not an easy doctrine because it's so well known, but I hope and pray that it will grab you as never before. The Bible says that justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, when you read the Bible, like I do, four times a year, not four times a year, through the Bible four times a year, all right, uh, the anger of God comes back again and again and again and again. And when you have the peace of God over against the anger, it is awesome. And Psalm 85 says, when that happens, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Now, that is my start, ladies and gentlemen. Why do you need the doctrine of justification and the substance of justification? Well, the Bible says righteousness and peace will kiss each other, and that's the problem. We are not righteous. Isaiah tells us uh, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Now, this is a clean rag, and I blow my nose, and I'm going to ask you, who wants to kiss it? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> and Philippians tells us that my righteousness is not just a filthy rag. It is dung. Now, who wants to kiss dung? <laughs> if I have a pot of dung and this hanky here, I think you prefer to kiss the hanky over the dung, all right? but you don't want to kiss it. And Isaiah says, I am ruined. 
When he sees the holiness of God in R.C. Sproul says, what it really means is I am disintegrating like a corpse in a coffin. Now, you don't want to kiss uh, a hanky, a, a filthy, filthy rag. You don't want to kiss dung. <laughs> you don't want to kiss a corpse in a coffin. Ladies and gentlemen, no way, Jose. <laughs> and that's what the Bible says. Now, Satan thought God could never cure it. Hey, God, you told Henry that if he's a sinner, he will die. Well, you cannot declare him not guilty. It's impossible. If Satan had believed that it was possible, he would have told the Pharisees, whatever you do is fine with me, but keep Jesus away from that cross. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that we are a filthy garment, that we are dung, and that we are a corpse in a coffin. Now, at one time, I spoke to a lady in one of my churches. I said, can you imagine that you are in a coffin for three days, like Lazarus? And then I asked you to stand up, and your flesh is dripping of your skeleton, and you have a nerve with one eye, and I hold a mirror in front of you. What do you think you would tell me? Put me back in that coffin! And I said to her husband, in that con connection, would you like to kiss your wife? She said, no way. And five minutes later, I opened the coffin again. And lady, you tell me, don't, keep me in. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. There's a flow of blood came through that coffin. And you'll be the most wonderful, beautiful lady on the face of this earth. And she gets up, and she looks in the mirror, and she is overawed. Now, I want you to be overawed when you think of what it takes to get you away from that filthy dung, that dung, and the disintegrating body. Look, it is legal, all right? Let me tell you, because you stand before the Lord. And the Lord says, how can I kiss you? That's impossible. And the Bible says that if you give your filthy garment, if you give your dung, if you give your disintegrating body to Jesus on the cross, he will wash you clean, totally, completely, and then out of the grave, because the cross and the resurrection always go together. The cross gets rid of the problems. The resurrection gives you the solutions. You remember? On the cross, your cobra heart was killed. In the resurrection, God gave, Jesus had new hearts that he was willing to implant in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that cross and that resurrection reoccurs in the doctrine of justification. On the cross, he washes you. And in the resurrection, he gives you his righteousness. And when his righteousness is given to you, he can declare you not guilty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is awesome. Awesome, awesome. Think about it. The incarnation. God himself in his son came and joined himself to a little baby. In the womb, came out of the womb, 
suck the breast of Mary, grew up. Incredible. And then he went to that cross. And I talked to you about wrath, right? Well, you read your Bible and you find wrath, wrath, wrath everywhere. We live in an ocean of wrath. And we must go to an island of peace. That wrath must be satisfied. And that was satisfied on the cross. We don't know what happened in three hours. It's indescribable. Indescribable that the wrath of God for three hours was totally exhausted in His Son. Totally exhausted. And then he says, you're washed. I declare you not guilty. I kiss you. No more a disintegrated body. No more garment. Filthy. No more dung. I kiss you. And God thumbs his nose at Satan. You thought it was impossible. Well, what no human could ever have found out that I have given to people who love me. And I promise you, when you recognize that the wrath of God was exhausted on the cross and he declares you not guilty, You'll never complain about anything any longer, about nothing. You'll never say why, because you know, I deserve eternal damnation. You say, why not, Lord? Because you're justified, and you honestly have peace with God. That is awesome. Think of the billions of people on the, this planet today, Muslims, Marxists, Buddhists, Hindus, who don't have peace with God. And they'll find it out in the day of judgment. Eternal damnation, the wrath of God will be poured out forever and ever. So it's a choice. It's either on Jesus or it is on us. But how do you know that you have the forgiveness of sins negatively and you have the imputed righteousness that is given to you? How do you know? Now, I cannot go into details, but you read 1 John. That is the letter written how you... How, how you know that you believe. And ladies and gentlemen, that is holiness. You are forgiven and you desire to be holy. It's very interesting. About five years ago, I had a, a few students in Africa and I said, folks, if you don't want to be holy, you're not going to make it. And we'll talk about that, Lord willing, on Friday. You're not going to make it. And just the other day, I got a little note. Holiness, holiness, holiness. That is the goal of my life from beginning to end. And that is why, brothers and sisters, when 3,000 people are converted on the day of Pentecost, they are devoting themselves to the Word and to fellowship and to the Lord's Supper and to prayer. That was their focus, ladies and gentlemen. The Word from Genesis to Revelation, they ate it up. And every service uh, from my vantage point should start with reading, uh, preaching the Word, and then the preacher should say, okay, talk about it, fellowship so that you know what I am talking about. And everybody knows it. It's different from socializing. Socializing, you're talking about anything under the sun. 
fellowship here to talk about the word. And you want to pass it on. And you want to know that word. And when you come to church, tell your pastor, I come to church because when I come out, I want to be a little bit more holy than when I come in. And then I know. You understand forgiveness of sins because you have a new heart, you have a new righteousness, and now you want to have a new holiness. And after every sermon, from my vantage point, people say, Ouch, Lord, give me Jesus. Let me give me the Lord's Supper because I want to be holy. So from my vantage point, after every sermon, the preacher should give you the Lord's Supper because without him you can do nothing. I can give you a word. I can tell you the action that must flow from that word, but you still cannot do it because you need Jesus. And you go to Jesus. And when you hear something today and you want it in your life, you go to Jesus. Now, finally, I have about eight minutes left. The question is, when does it show that you are justified? Well, think of Isaiah. I am disintegrating like that little lady. You remember? Comes out of the coffin and she's just the most beautiful woman on the face of this earth. I told her husband, would you like to kiss her now? He said, yes. I said, well, you're too late now. <laughs> you should have done it earlier. All right. But that's a little joke. Uh, you, can, don't, you don't need to laugh. At uh, uh, <laughs> any rate, any rate, any rate, any rate, what does God say? He comes out of the coffin, Isaiah. He sees himself washed with the imputed righteousness of Jesus, quote, unquote. And God says, whom shall I send? Now, there's a little song that we sing in Africa all the time. When he calls me, I will answer. Now, I like the song, but it's not fully biblical. You know what you must say? When you come out of that coffin and God says, whom shall I send? You make application. And I've asked people, Pete preachers, how often do you have folks in the church to apply to you to be sent out? And they always say, I've never had that before. And I say, if you don't get that before, you have not preached the doctrine of justification so that they understand it and get it. I'm willing to talk a million times about the fact that you need a heart transplant. Do you remember what I said to you last fall, if you have that heart transplant, you have a new vision. Because if you're not born again, you cannot see and you cannot enter. But when you have the heart transplant, you have a new vision. And you do not only see Jesus for the first time, you also see people as saved or lost. The first thing, your children, friends, parents, spouses, doesn't make any difference. Saved or lost. If you don't look at people like this, I will repeat the doctrine of regeneration until you finally tell me, wait a minute, I'm beginning to see people differently. Now, we see them as annoying. We see them as white or black. We see them as uh, whole, old or young. We see them as sick or healthy. But when you're born again, you no longer see that in the first instance. You look around, even among your friends, are you saved or are you lost? And when you have that righteousness, Isaiah shows that you do not only have a new vision, 
but you have a new passion. Send me. Send me. I apply to be sent. And if you don't apply to be sent, please forgive me. I'm fighting for your souls. Don't tell me you understand the doctrine of justification. Ho hum. Well, I'm washed. Oh, no, 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 no. The lady was in the coffin and she comes out a second time. Wow. And if you turn wow around, you get M O M. Mamma mia. Awesome. Send me, send me, send me, send me. And that's what I want to see in me and in you. And if you always complain about stuff, if you always are under the gun or on the run and you don't have a new vision and you don't have a new passion, you cannot be the pipeline for others. And if you're not a pipeline for others in the day of judgment, God will ask you, have you been a pipeline for others? And if you say, not really, then God says, your life was a waste in my kingdom. That's right. Now, if that does convict me, I have a problem. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is convicting. And if people tell you something and you're not convicted, you're fighting the Word of God when you're convicted. Lord, where is my vision? Lord, where is my passion? Now, there's a sequel, the Lord willing, on Friday, how you're going to work that out. But I have only one minute left, two minutes left. So I want to give you a one-liner, two one-liners that I want you to remember for the rest of your life. If you're not born, you have no life. Agreed, right? If you're not reborn, you have no life, even if it looks like. But you don't. And you tell the Lord, please give me your heart. Then... If you're not justified, you have no peace. And the anger of God is upon you. And the wrath is going to come. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been over 30 years in the college, but the highlights of my college career was not that the students got an A or an A+. Plus. Well, they were converted in my classroom. And it doesn't happen enough. Because the Apostle Paul says, when I talk to the Corinthians, some of you don't have the knowledge of God. I have found in my over 60 years of experience that when you have a group like this, there are always people who are not born again and who are not justified. And that breaks me up on the inside. And I told the, ch the president in the college, if we don't fill the cracks for the students in the college and they fall through it, it's our fault. If they jump off, it's their fault. So my plea is that you pray for at least one convert. And for the rest of you wretched saints that you are growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you desire to talk about this more in specifics, I said, I see men walking like trees. I'm sure the chaplain and I are more than willing to talk to you. So the one-liner, if you're not born again, you have no life. If you're not justified, you have no peace with God. And my prayer is that you have a heart transplant, and you're washed, and you have the imputed righteousness that comes from above, and that you will show it. 
I look at people as saved or lost. Pastor, please send me. I want to be a pipeline to others. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me pray. Father God, the time is up. This is what your Bible tells us. And I plead with you that somehow, Lord, people will respond in their hearts. And they will say, we want to be born again. We want to be justified. Well, as we hope to see on Friday, we call on the name of the Lord. Then it is going to happen. And the joy of the Lord will come into our lives. And we become pipelines to others. And we'll be useful in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Although we do not see him, we love him. With joy inexpressible and full of glory. And we pray that in his name and for his sake. Amen.